Welcome back to the latest episode of The Super's Kid. From Harlem to Homicide to Hollywood. My name is Randy Jurgensen. Today I want to speak about 1971. As we are doing this episode, um, that's 50 years ago. 50 years ago. In 1971, I was a um, 12 years on the job. I was a second grade detective. Uh, on my way to first grade detective, I was working in Harlem and I was working in homicide. Um, Hollywood would come calling here now in 1971. But before I get into 1971, I want to tell you how I got here and why it's such an important, uh, important year. A year that would see uh, my career as a police officer change, uh, a new career opening up in Hollywood. So let me go back. In 19, late 1966, late 1967, uh, I received a letter uh, from, um, from the United States uh, Secretary of War, Defense. Uh, I, I don't exactly know the title. I have the, uh, I have the letter. And they were asking me to uh, return uh, to the military. I had served uh, honorably uh, from 1951 to 1953, which is three years. Uh, I had no obligations, uh, none whatsoever. Uh, there was no draft, but they were asking me to return. And they actually wrote this letter to the uh, police commissioner's office of the city of New York. So, um, the response was uh, yes, and I went out and uh, took a, a, a series of uh, physicals, more than one, um, some uh, mental aptitude tests, if you will, and I passed those tests, and I was uh, sworn back in to the military, uh, to the military, uh, with a guarantee uh, that I would not be uh, sent uh, to Vietnam. Um, <clears throat> and I was a Green Beret. Um, back in the 50s, I was a paratrooper jumping out of airplanes. Uh, here in the 60s, part of my training was repelling from helicopters. And of course, the, the Vietnam War was raging on. I... Uh, I, in 1968, in 1968, the police department, the police commissioner's office wrote back uh, to the secretary of the army, the defense, who, whomever they were, and my services were required back to be a, um, a detective uh, back in, in New York City. Uh, New York City give to the rising amount of crime uh, that was happening uh, happening in the city. I I returned. I returned. Um, in time in 1968 to uh, be a part of, not a witness, but the killing of a man with a dream. I was working in Harlem. I was working with one of the best detectives that I could ever uh, work with. His name was Ambrose and um, he was black. And I remember when the news came over, uh, we had to go into the street because 
in Harlem at that time, there was still hope. And with the killing of Martin Luther King, hope was replaced by anger. And so for three days, of which we did not go home, um, there were fires, uh, there were shootings. I'm not excusing this, but I, I understood it. And I remember walking to the upper part of Harlem where all of this was going on. And I turned to Ambrose and all I could do was apologize that I, that I was sorry. Uh, before the year was out, uh, <clears throat> they would kill. Uh, they would kill a senator who had a, a sense of a different direction to try and and take take the country, and he was killed. But in in 1968, <clears throat> I was doing back undercover work. Not like I did, uh, not like I did, which uh, gave us the movie Cruising, not that type of undercover work or not the kind of un undercover work uh, in narcotics that gave us the movie The French Connection. Uh, this, this undercover work was to go into various night spots uh, and these night spots were actually being shook down because we were dealing strictly in money. There was a certain amount of money that you had to pay to get in there. And it, it, it sounds like, you know, it was nothing. Uh, possibly it was $10 a, $10 a head. But just remember, I'm talking... 1968. It's very easy for me to say it's probably a hundred dollars a head today, and it was all cash. And so uh, the boys from Brooklyn, uh, mob from Brooklyn, unnamed, they would go to various clubs, and they would actually, um, you know, shake down, if you will, or the clubs had to pay a fee. And it was like an entrance fee, and that would be their that would be their cut uh, uh, of the night. One of them, one of them was a club that was located on fifty fifty uh, third Street, and it was called Authors. And Authors, uh, um, <clears throat> and Authors uh, was a club that was put together by uh, people in the movie industry who contributed money, um, uh, Sammy Davis Jr., the, name them. Uh, and the club was run by uh, Sybil Burton. At the time, she was uh, uh, Richard Burton's wife. Uh, they had a band in there, six or seven piece band, but they also, they also played, um, you know, turnstile, uh, turnstile music that you could dance. This was a very popular club. So I'm in there one night and my brother-in-law had graduated the police academy, maybe the month before. And so, um, my sister wanted to go to the club and it was a bit of a, a celebration for my brother-in-law uh, be, uh, be, be becoming a cop. Um, <clears throat> I tell you right here and now, back in the day, back then, I did a lot of bouncing. Bouncing from, not, not, not while working, bouncing in, in various clubs. I love to dance. Uh, I would hit, hit these clubs, uh, including like the Copacabana uh, with Eddie Egan. Why I bring that up is that to this day, I don't drink because I can't drink. <laughs> Not that I was an alcoholic. One drink and I'm out of it. So I would go to these clubs and I would nurse a drink, believe me, for an hour, an hour and a half. That would be the extent of it. 
So I'm in this club one night. I'm there with my uh, I'm there with my sister, and in in the club that night would be Frank Sinatra's uh, future wife, uh, 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 Mia Farrow. Uh, Jennifer O'Neill was in there. She was coming off of a picture called The Summer of uh, Forty Two, a beautiful a, a beautiful movie, and there were other celebrities that were in the club. When all of a sudden I heard, and at a future, a future date, I will go into this much more. Uh, there's much more to be said about that night. I just can't cover it all tonight because I want to speak about 1971. So I heard people screaming that there was a commotion outside of the club. And uh, they said uh, 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 they're beating up a police officer. It was along the lines like that. I immediately ran outside and um, there was an alleyway right alongside of the club. And the light, the light cut the alleyway like in half. In other words, it was light on one side and completely dark on the other side. <clears throat> As I got out there, I not only heard gunshots, but I saw the flashes from the guns in the dark. And out of the dark, like a dream, like a movie uh, sequence, came a uniformed police officer. His name was John Vareca. Um, his entire family, they had all joined the cousins, the brother, whatever. They had all joined the fire department, but John decided to become a police officer. And as he staggered out, he fired a shot from his gun. And the shot went clean across the street and it hit the bank window. And that sent the alarm off. Out of the dark, into the light, as the police officer was laying down, the two perpetrators, killers, uh, <clears throat> they emerged and they <clears throat> got out onto the street. One on the north side of the street, the other on the south side of the street. I immediately got out into the middle of the street and basically it was their move. And so the guy on the north side of the street started to make a run for it. I immediately, I immediately ran in between the cars as he was running to get on the sidewalk, to get behind him uh, when a shot was fired. Uh, the shot was fired so close to me that the residue from the from the shot, uh, I felt the, the the residue or the wax, whatever it was, behind my ear, and I could not hear anything. I couldn't hear a thing, and <clears throat> that would last for a full day. I caught him. As I say, I will go into much more detail. I caught him. And a, a, a radio car showed up and the uh, second perpetrator was going south towards 51st Street and Lexington Avenue. And guess what? That's exactly where the 17th Precinct is located. It's 12 o'clock at night. Those that were working 4 to 12, they're coming into the precinct. And those that are about to work to go out from 12 midnight to 8 o'clock in the morning, they're coming out. And that's who this guy ran into. They caught him immediately. And we went into the police station. Now, before the night was over, before the night was over, um, it was decided that these two would face the electric chair, which had not been in use uh, five, six, seven years. So the answer to crime 
was they were going to bring back the electric chair and it would be a deterrent. And I'm going to stop right there because I'm telling you the electric chair was and is not a deterrent to crime. It is not. I have stacks. I have facts. I, I can prove that, but not here and now. The problem, the problem was I had been interviewed and had a piece in the New York Times because there was talk of always bringing back the electric chair. It just so happens that I, Randy Jurgensen, was going to have the first case. However, in my interview in the Times, I went into great detail of why it would not work, uh, why life imprisonment would be better. From an expense point of view, from an expense point of view, to put somebody in the electric chair, even back then in 1968, was a million dollars or more, a million dollars or more. And the appeals would just continue and continue. And to house that person in special units uh, on death row, the cost was astronomical. And it did not work as a deterrent. So that's what it was in the Times. And now here I was going to have the first capital case for the electric chair. So <clears throat> as I say in the future, I will go into much more detail about that. What came out of that after the arrest and the arraignment and the indictment, what came out of that was that uh, there was $50,000 placed on my head. Um, <clears throat> that sort of set a, di a different way as to the way I was doing the job or sort of living my life, uh, knowing, knowing <clears throat> that there was a price on my head. So <clears throat> to get back to 1971, um, <clears throat> in October of 1971, uh, that was a career changing month for me. The beginning of 1971, I was finishing, I was finishing in March, April, uh, working on the motion picture, The French Connection. Now, every day off that I had, uh, and I've said this in the past, every day off that I had, every hour that I had off, I had, I was working on the French Connection movie. Suddenly, in 19, 1971, I found myself uh, working on three movies almost in succession, if not overlapping. Um, I went to work on The Godfather. And of course, in the future, I will go into much more detail. But I was working on The Godfather. And boy, what a cast that was. And I would meet every one of them. Um, and some remain friends today. Um, <clears throat> I was working on um, a, a picture called uh, The Seven Ups. I was, uh, I was working on a picture called uh, Badge 373, of which was being made about my partner, my friend, Eddie Egan. Uh, that was his badge number, 373, and it starred Ro uh, Robert Duvall and look up the cast in that movie. So <clears throat> uh, I would soon go to work on uh, Report to the Commissioner, which uh, came out of the book, uh, another great cast, introduced me to uh, somebody that is a friend to today, Hector Alessandro. So all of this was going on in 1970, 1971. Never 
did I lose one minute, not one minute, I promise you, of the job that I had to do as a homicide detective. In fact, I began to take cast members, directors, actually took them to work with me. They, they came while I was working, they would come into the precinct. Uh, when I had when I had a homicide, no, uh, no, I did not exactly take them to the scene of the homicide, but they exactly saw what I did. That was all in 1971. A lot of that, a lot of that, it would continue, but not, not in the time frame or in the time that I would do this because in May of 1971, it was the beginning of the assassination of New York City police officers. Within 71 to 1972, 13 New York City police officers would be set up and executed. I'm using that word because we know in a day-to-day -day basis of doing the job, police officers uh, lose their lives. They definitely lose their lives. However, what I'm talking about now or what was happening then, these police officers were being drawn to a certain location and then they were fired upon. Um, <clears throat> these police officers were um, Irish, Italian, Spanish, white, black, uh, two of them, Vietnam veterans, decorated, names like Piagentini and Jones, Foster and Laurie, Curry and Benetti. And they were being executed by a group that had no social redeeming value whatsoever. They, their mission, they were dedicated to kill New York City police officers. I would learn uh, later on. Now, <clears throat> I keep saying I. <clears throat> I always worked with a team. I always worked with uh, some, of, some of the best detectives that I would ever encounter on the job. So <clears throat> when I'm saying I, uh, I mean it personally, but not alone. So <clears throat> I, would, I would learn later on that they had looked at uh, a motion picture called the Battle for or the Battle of Algiers. And that story goes in the following. It goes that uh, the French army was in Algiers and no matter what they did, they really could not take over Algiers. Uh, what was happening was insurrection, uh, what was happening, bombings, whatever it was. So France then sent an elite group in there and they were the paratroopers uh, from uh, uh, France. And they, they couldn't quell what was going on. And suddenly, whoever it was said, let's boost up and support the Algerian police. And that's what they did. And as soon as the, the police, who obviously are Algerians, um, it, it, began to, it began to quell what was going on in the city. However, if you want to call them freedom fighters, terrorists, whatever you want to call them, they began to strike at the police officer's family, at the police officer's friends. 
And one day, one day, the entire police force did not come to work. They did not. This can be verified. It can be looked up. One week later, France left Algiers. And it is indirectly, directly, because the police department collapsed. This was the film that they were looking at. And so you could see the connection from that film as to what was going on with the Black Liberation Army. They were operating out of cells. For instance, in the opening scene of the Battle of or the Battle for Algiers, there's a cop standing out in the street. I don't know if he's directing traffic, but he's just standing there. A man in civilian clothes walks up behind him, puts a gun to his head and kills him. And then the man walks away. We can definitely see the connection of these police officers in New York City being called to a location and it was false and three or four members of the Black Liberation Army of a certain cell would walk up and execute these police officers. Well, this happened in 1971. That was the first. And they were Piagentini and Jones. And I, I was working. I was working that night. I was working that night. And, um, if you're going to hear any noise, it's, uh, it's, it's my dog and she's chewing on a bone. So let's, let's continue. Um, <clears throat> I was working that night and I had a witness in the car, in the squad car, which had a radio. And, uh, that witness <clears throat> I knew was going to soon be arrested for a homicide in another command, but I needed him as a witness for the homicide that I was working on. I hope that's not too complicated. When the call came over, shots fired, uh, 1013, uh, gave the location, it, 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 it gave all of that. So I immediately, I immediately what I did was I drove to the nearest precinct which was the 32nd precinct. And this is where the shootings took place. And I drove and I dropped that witness off and said, you know, he is a prisoner. I told the precinct that. I then did not go to the scene of the shooting. I went to the scene, I went to Holm Hospital. Now I've said somewhat, <clears throat> I'm talking 50 years ago and it is uh, it's still hard it's still hard to talk about this I, uh, I got to Harlem Hospital and the first thing that I saw was maybe 25, 30, 40 cops all there in uniform smoking cur cursing, screaming and uh, all wanting to give blood and you know Maybe I got a funny bone, I don't know. I just wondered who the hell was watching the streets because everybody, everybody there was at Harlem Hospital. And yes, our brothers, our brothers had been shot. And Piagentini, Italian white, <clears throat> Waverly Jones, black. Brothers, brothers. They all wore that magnificent blue uniform. So <clears throat> I went downstairs uh, to the morgue and I uh, <clears throat> assisted doing what's necessary. And that would be <clears throat> making sure that Pictures were taken. Uh, 
Did he have his weapon? Was there anything missing to secure his clothes? To await the medical examiner? Jones was still upstairs. <clears throat> Jones was still upstairs and um, he would die on the table. And one of the things that came about was that Piagentini, Piagentini's gun was uh, was missing. So I said that 1971 would be career changes for me. <clears throat> the toughest part that night was meeting the families. And as I say, in, in future episodes, I will go into much more details. But this is really about career changing. So having $50,000 on my head, having working every waking moment on these motion pictures, it would drive me into uh, becoming uh, an actor of which I joined Screen Actors Guild. This would lead for me getting into a, a very prestigious organization called, uh, the, you know, the Directors Guild of America, which would be the, uh, the, the DGA. I would wind up, I would wind up as a producer uh, of, of my own movies. Uh, however, <clears throat> It would be a career change as to I spent the next three or four years chasing cop killers, chasing, chasing cop killers. Uh, my home life would uh, change. I would, could not put down my mailing, uh, my, I could not put down my home address. My license plate was changed. Uh, my, my, my life changed. My life changed in, in, in 1971. It did. And the top part of it was, the top part of it was, we went to trial in October of 1971 for six weeks. And I will go into much more detail than I am right now. And we convicted both, both of them, soldiers, uh, from Brooklyn in a mob that killed that police officer and they were looking at the uh, electric chair. However, the federal government st struck that down as uh, being inhumane. So what, what, came, what, came out of, what came out of 1971? Well, what came out of 1971 Certainly, there was a, a career change within the police department. Uh, <clears throat> what came out of 1971, there certainly was a, a, a career change that I never knew, uh, which would complete what this series is about, you know, from Harlem to homicide to Hollywood. I will be discussing this in, 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 future, in, in future episodes. Um, again, 1971 was really, for me, uh, a, a, a life, a lifetime uh, uh, change, uh, change for me. So, hope to see you the next time, and God bless.